this is Christy Shriver. And this is Gary Shriver. And this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Today, we're concluding our discussion over the small but powerful narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Indeed, and as powerful as the narrative is, it is by no means the end of the story for Frederick Douglass. In fact, it's only the beginning. Frederick Douglass can be quoted as saying, and I quote him, My free life began on the 3rd of September, 1838, on the morning of the 4th of that month, after an anxious, anxious and most perilous but safe journey, I found myself in the big city of New York, a free man, one more added to the mighty throng, which, like the confused waves of the troubled sea, surged to and fro between the lofty walls of Broadway. So there you go. He ends the story, but begins a life which will end in him telling this story at least three times. And so in this episode, we'll conclude our discussion of the narrative itself, but really, we're going to do what Paul Harvey would call tell the rest of the story. And it is to Douglas's credit that the story took as long as it did to get out. Douglas escaped in 1838. He published the narrative that we've been analyzing in 1845, but he did not discuss the details of his escape until 1881 when his revised autobiography was released. We clearly suggest in this last section that he did feel somewhat of a desire to tell the story. Maybe it's the drama, the heroism. I can imagine there's a thrill of retelling this, but he said that there's several reasons why he didn't. The first would be, obviously, the immediate close of an avenue for escape for other slaves. In other words, if he tells people how he did it, then duh, no one would be able to right. do it. <laughs> the slave catchers would read the book. And But number two, it would endanger the lives of the people who actually helped him. So to use the eloquence of Douglas, this is what he says about people who help other people escape and then talk about it. They do nothing towards enlightening the slave while they do much towards enlightening the master. They stimulate him to greater watchfulness and enhance his power to capture his slave. Right. And Douglas took a little bit of issue with some northern abolitionists that he felt were not respecting the dangers of escaping slaves. And they were too willing to brag on their contribution to getting people out of slavery, but at the same time endanger them by publishing their methods. Which is understandable. You know, you can never really know if you don't really have skin in the game. And, and you want yeah. <laughs> True. All right. Okay. Let's somewhat summarize a series of events. And as we do, we can hit the broader points Douglas is making, which in some ways are an argument as to the value of capitalism. Sounds good. Last week, we ended our discussion with Douglas's failed attempt to escape. And it's at this point uh, where you see at the end of chapter 10, Douglas's return to Baltimore. And he has to go back, basically, not because he's in trouble, but he has to save his own. Well, his masters feel like they have to get him out of there to save his own life. His attempt had gone poorly. Nobody wanted him near other slaves. They were afraid he was going to make them want to escape. And so he thought he was going to be sold off to some Alabama or Georgia slave traders because that seems like the threat. I've seen that more than once in this book. That's the threat that they always held over their head, that oh. if you do poorly, you'll have to go down to the southern southerner slaves. Right, which <laughs> to throw out a phrase, a historical phrase, the phrase being sold down the river means you have to go to the worst. The farther right. south you go, the worse right. it is. It usually meant as a slave, if you got sold down a river, you could end up in a Louisiana plantation, and that would be the worst. That's how they felt would be the worst. Who knows if that was the worst, but that was the rumor. Anyway, Captain Ald is going to miraculously choose to send him back to his brother in Baltimore, and it's there that Mr. Hugh, or Master Hugh, decides to hire him out to a man named Mr. Gardner. And this is kind of a changing point in his life because Mr. Gardner teaches Douglas how to caulk. Now, I'm not sure I clearly understand what is caulking. I know it has something to do with ships, obviously. Well, I guess that means you have no future in building wooden ships. Uh, zero. Okay, so, uh, of course, Baltimore is a, a very important shipyard where... 
Uh, they built ships, actually, and his job would have been to, as they build the ship with its wooden planks, he goes in and he fills in the gaps between the wooden planks with all kinds of different materials, the whole point of which is you're sealing up the ship so that it won't leak. So he basically uh, goes in there and seals up the holes of ships so that they can be uh, watertight. So he learns this trade, and... Things kind of go a little poorly with Mr. Gardner, and he, Mr. Hugh kind of pulls him out. And I want to read the last paragraph of this chapter 10 because I think it really uh, informs a change in Douglas's mind, and he kind of understands the value of money. Now, remember, slaves don't have money, and they have no connection to anything financial. But he says this, I was now getting, as I have said, $1.50 per day. I contracted for it. I earned it. It pay, It was paid to me and it was rightfully my own. Yet upon returning Saturday night, I was compelled to deliver every cent of that money to Master Hugh. And why? Not because he earned it. Not because he had any hand in earning it. Not because I owed it to him. Not because he possessed the slightest shadow of a right to it. But solely because he had the power to compel to give it up. The right of a grim-visaged pirate upon the high seas is exactly the same. And it's not the last time we're going to see him compare slave owners to pirates. What do you think of that? I think it's a, a very interesting and insightful analogy. You know, pirates do strike fear in your heart when they come to steal from you. Uh, but it's also an amazing moment in Douglas's life when he is understanding the value of his labor. Right. Which as a slave is a is an amazing transition when your labor had not had value. Now all of a sudden it has value to yourself. And you begin to understand it for the first time. And he understands that now he's going to make six dollars a week. Uh, and they have this agreement. He works all week long for six dollars. And at the end of the week, he has to give his money to Master Hugh and Master Hugh gives him six cents back, kind of as spending money, and this makes him mad. Well, it would make any regular working person mad. And to me, I think it's fascinating that um, Douglas understands the way in which he's being robbed. He even goes so far as to say that his master giving him the six cents was an actual confession that he had stolen the whole six dollars why do you think that's true how do how does that work so how is that an admission that you've stolen the whole six dollars because you realize that you were owed something well in douglas's eyes he's trying to say this was the master's guilt offering it was just enough money to make the master's thieving conscious rest that he had somehow been benevolent. Generous. He didn't have to give right, anything. for the six cents, but yet he did. Well, after two months of this arrangement, you know, he I guess he just made him so upset he felt like he had to do something. So he makes this offer of a different financial arrangement. And this time he asks for these terms to be a, an, basically the same thing, but yet psychologically very different. Mm -hmm. So what he wants to do is he wants to be allowed to work, to live on his own, to be responsible for his own bills. Because at this point, he was living with Mr. Mr. Hugh. Mr. Hugh paid for his food, his clothes, everything, and he had to give all of his money up. We wanted to make another arrangement that he would pay for his house, lodging, food, and everything, but he would give him $3 a week at the end of the week instead of 6 and then be responsible for everything else. What do you think of that? Well, it's a... I, oh, I got so many thoughts about this, uh, and I'm going to digress for just a moment. So, back during the Cold War in the United States, and that the Soviet Union, that is a bit Union, of a digression. It is. We're <laughs> we're going to hop ahead a hundred years, okay? Yeah. A little over a hundred years. There were always stories about uh, Soviets defecting to the United States, and I saw an article years and years and years ago. That I found so interesting that it estimated of all the Soviets that defected to the United States during the Cold War, about 50% of them went back. And the question is, why would they go back? Well, because moving into the fast-paced capitalistic lifestyle of the United States was just overwhelming to them, and they couldn't do it. But yet, here is Frederick Douglass 
ad- adapting immediately to this whole idea of his own capitalistic venture and being able to uh, make his own money. Well, he says this, It relieved him of all need of looking after me. His money was sure. He received all the benefits of slave holding without its slave holding without its evils, while I endured all the evils of a slave and suffered all the care and anxiety of a free man. I found it a hard bargain, but hard as it was, I thought it better than the old mode of getting along. It was a step towards freedom to be allowed to bear the responsibilities of a free man, and I was determined to hold on upon it. What do you think about that? This idea that the concept of responsibility is what mm-hmm. makes you a man. Yes, he. that theme is throughout the book. And that responsibility is the path to freedom, responsibility is the path to manhood, the responsibility is the path to identity. And what I love about his reasoning is that he is so calculatingly pragmatic. This is not an emotional decision. He made a cost-benefit analysis of his current situation against what his future situation could be and understood that accepting responsibility was the way to transact that. And not only did he do it, which is amazing, he's able to write it and put it in words and explain it, which is a very complicated idea to explain. Well, this worked out well until he made a bad mistake. And what happened was he he was supposed to give his money on Saturday night, but one particular Saturday night, he chose not to do it. He went out of town and said, ah, I'll just give him his money when I get back. Well, apparently, <laughs> Master Hugh flipped out. And mm-hmm. I guess he thought he ran away. Who knows what he thought. But things did not go well when Douglas came back. Here we were upon the point of coming to blows. He raved and swore his de- determination to get hold of me. I did not allow myself a single word, but resolved... If he laid the weight of his hand upon me, it should be blow for blow. He did not strike me, but told me that he would find me in constant employment in the future. So the whole idea of you being out on your own completely went out of whack. And they have this exchange. He didn't work for a whole week. And he lied around because Douglas is like, all right, if you're going to go find work, go find work. And then he didn't. And so he just sat around in that next couple of weeks. (laughs) He put the responsibility back on the master and the master failed with the responsibility. Yes. But in the end, what ultimately happened is he got a job himself and he worked really well. And he made the situation as such that Master Hugh thought that things were going well. And as Master Hugh thought that things were going better and better, all this time he was plotting and plotting to run away. He says, the wretchedness of slavery and the blessedness of freedom were perpetually before me. It was life and death with me, but I remained firm. And according to my resolution on the third day of September, 1838, I left my chains and succeeded in reaching New York without the slightest interruption of any kind. And of course, he doesn't tell how he did it at all. And when I read the book, I was like, well, that's the most exciting part. Why right. Why would we you want, not tell? We didn't hear that. Well, he explains very in the very beginning of the chapter why he's not going to tell. So if you read it in 1845, you had to wait for the answer until 1881. But before I tell you about his escape, I want to go back to this discussion with uh, Master Hugh. And what's interesting about the Master Hugh discussion is Master Hugh is telling him that he would be happy if he had no plans for the future. Uh, He said, Master Hugh advised me to complete thoughtlessness of the future. And so the compelling drive in Southern Douglas in all these discussions was his future, his future, his future. He kept contemplating his own future. He kept forecasting himself into the future, which is a a very great psychological trait that that's part of surviving is be able to cash yourself in the future. And master, Hugh was saying, ignore the future, be rid of it. Well, and master Hugh isn't wrong. And let me say, master Hugh has made very good points about what it takes to be a slave. If you remember <laughs> back in chapter seven, when he said, if you teach a slave to read, he'll be unhappy. Mm-hmm. So he really understood. And I guess it's kind of a sick way of looking at the world that, if he was going to have, like, he wanted to have a slave almost, but he wanted to have a happy slave. Right. And he kind of knew what you had to, 
to be to be that. You had to be as dumb as possible and as unable to project into the future as possible. And if you could be that person, then we both can be happy. And it's an arrangement, ideal slavery, which in his mind was perfectly, was acceptable. You eat, you think not, and I'll do the rest. (laughs) I'm going to digress on a short psychological note here, too, because there are some similarities uh, between a slavery and abuse victims. I'm not going to say there's a direct parallels, but there are some ideas that are similar. And abuse victims begin to get out of their abuse when they can forecast themselves into a positive future. And so when the victim begins to understand, if I'm willing to take responsibility to make changes and see myself in a positive future, I can go where I need to go. This is something that Douglas was innately doing. I think that's an excellent parallel because there's no doubt that that's exactly an abusive. There's nothing more abusive than holding a person bondage. And in some sense, his ability to escape was his, what he would say was his ability to see himself, even with Mr. Covey, is beyond that. But anyway, yeah. September 3, he calls that his birthday, doesn't he? Right. He, <laughs> in all of his works, he talks about that being his day of freedom. That's when his freedom began. And in the future, he decided that September 3rd would be his official birthday since he established early in the book he didn't know what his birthday was. So September 3rd is officially... Frederick Douglass's birthday. All right, without a drum roll, because I don't think I could do that in a microphone. Tell us, how did it happen? So uh, Douglass is going to disguise himself as a free black sailor during this time period. He's in a port town with lots of sailing vessels. It's a great setup. Uh, He's able to get himself a a uniform, an actual military-style uniform that passes for a military uniform, And he was able to forge and create a sailor's protection pass so that when he uh, made subsequent parts of the journey, whether it's getting on a ship or whether it's getting on uh, a train, he was able to produce this document. And within 24 hours of leaving Maryland, he was in New York City. So, wow, what a a day. (laughs) That would be a day. And, of course, if you had... uh... And if you read the narration, he talks about like all the different times he thought he was going to get caught. He yes. recognizes somebody or the description on the pass wasn't actually. It kind of reminded me when college kids that are underage try to slip into bars and they get people's IDs that don't look like them. <laughs> then that's what he was doing. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and if you analyze it analogy. closely, you know, if the guy had looked at it closely, he would have known that that wasn't the description but the guy didn't pay enough attention to, right. to care, so he was able to, to make it work. According to Douglas, when he handed the train conductor his papers, he said, I, I've got this document with an American eagle on me that American eagle on it that protects me everywhere I go. And he said that the conductor was so mesmerized by the, the gloriousness of the document, he didn't thoroughly read the description, which would not have fit Douglas at all during that time. So he gets to New York, and I can only imagine, he describes it, and I've tried to put myself into this mindset, how it would feel for your, you've never been, a, you've never been free in your entire life, you're dropped off in the magnitude and the enormity of New York City, and when I go to New York City, I feel that feeling too, it's mm-hmm. so big and it's so overwhelming, and he's struck with the idea that he's 100% alone. Nobody, he's left everything. He knows no one. No one knows him. No one can take care of him. He's 100% on his own, and and this somewhat overwhelms him. Which is uh, a point I want to make previous to this. Right before he decides to escape, his, his excitement and fear and adrenaline of escape is all of a sudden overwhelmed by the sadness of realizing all the people that he's leaving. And it occurred to him right before escaping, I'll never see these people again. And that was so, such a strong uh, emotion on him. It, it made him second guess even escaping. Well, it doesn't even comment. I mean, I know he does. He says there's lots of people that could escape and even might escape, but the cost is too great. How could I possibly leave everything that I know and I love and I just can't even the responsibility that I have to these people isn't worth my freedom and lots of people made that choice which is understandable but in his case he has a plus one (laughs) and I want to point out the story of the plus one that 
the famous or really the not famous Anna Murray. Uh, Rosetta Douglas Bragg, his daughter, uh, said in a speech delivered in the 1900s that the story of Frederick Douglass's hopes and aspirations and longing desire for freedom has been told. She says this, you all know it, but it was a story made possible by the unswerving loyalty of Anna Murray. So Anna Murray was a free woman. She met Douglas in church, and I really do think she deserves a shout out. She's one of history's forgotten women, but she was a domestic wor- worker. She Her parents had been slaves, and she leaves home at 17. There's a series of reasons how uh, she became free. But anyway, she was extremely, apparently good with money, extremely good with math, even though she was never literate. To the day she died, she was never literate. And she kept up a bu- kept a lot of money, saved money, and she actually, you know that uniform you were talking mm-hmm. about? Anna made that. And she sold a bed that she had in her house. She had two beds. She sold one of them, and she bought the ticket and got him out. So she got... She made him. No Anna, no Frederick. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Very, very important. Well, anyway, they after she after he escapes, she does follow him, and they're married by a Mr. David Ruggles, and she brings with her from Baltimore everything that they were going to use to start their lives because Frederick had nothing. She brought a feather bed. She brought dishes. She brought cutlery. She bought clothes. And she bought everything that they were going to need. And that's that's how he was able to start his life. That was not just the physical and financial support, but that was his base. And they kind of started this life together. And, of course, they're going to – I know we're going to get into this, but just to finish out her part, uh, they settled in. They had four children, Rosetta, Lewis, Charles, and Frederick Jr. Of course, the men – those heard their sons fought in the Civil War later on. But um, she raised the family all those years – When he was out doing a lot of the stuff that's made him famous, she never learned to read. She always paid the bills. She did everything in terms of their finances. She was, of course, I I don't know that that was that unusual at that time, being a a woman. They did a lot of that stuff, but she had no training for that. So I just want to point out before we take a step further, shout out to the amazing Anna Murray Douglas. There you go. What a great contribution. (laughs) Yes, a 1,000% contribution. (laughs) Well, so they've settled in New York City, but they're not safe because the streets of New York City are crawling with slave catchers, or as he calls them, money-loving kidnappers that are willing to uh, to kidnap these uh, runaway slaves and send them back to the South. So Mr. Ruggles and the other abolitionists say you've got to go somewhere else. And they have to change their name. And there becomes this discussion, you know, what should our name be? And this this idea of what is your identity? Malcolm X actually talks about this later on when he talks about African Americans and this problem that they had, I guess, for many years of understanding who you were when your family lineage had no name and no identity. And Douglas is going to confront this head on, and he has to ch- kind of create, improvise, and make up this new name. And he comes across this name, the name Douglas. He got this name from a poem. Mr. Johnson had been reading this poem, Lady of the Lake. And in this poem by Sir Walter Scott, it was written in 1810, there's this historical character named Scott Lord James of Douglas. And this particular uh, lord was exiled. He was a Scottish chieftain, but he was revered for his goodness and bravery. So Mr. Johnson, having read this poem, said, hmm, that's the perfect name for you. And of course, it's lived on much longer than the poem, which no one's ever read. (laughs) Well, and I also want to point out that Mr. Johnson does another very interesting thing. Mr. Johnson gives him the last name Douglas, but he makes this comment. Um, He said, uh, I gave Mr. Johnson the privilege of choosing me a name, but told him he must not take from me the name of Frederick. I must hold on to that to preserve a sense of my identity. What do you have to make of that? 
names are extremely important. Names are your identity. Uh, your name be, you becomes uh, a statement of your essence in the world, and it's your it's your cachet, if you will. And so names are very very important, and preserving a name from time and creating identity with it's very important. So he keeps the old and adds to the new and becomes Frederick Douglass. And of course, Anna and Frederick Douglass move to New Bedford. And he becomes overwhelmed with how different it was compared to what he thought it was going to be, which I thought was a very interesting discussion. In some ways, a shout out to the virtues of capitalism. Well, it is. And I have to digress for a moment. We have to bring in a couple of ideas that were very prominent and prevalent during this time period and make a comparison and contrast. So... Probably the most um, eloquent spokesman for the defense of slavery in the South was John C. Calhoun, the senator from South Carolina. John C. Calhoun had been vice president of the United States. He'd served in presidential cabinets, had a very long career. But the older he got, the more entrenched he became in protecting the power of the South over the government and consequently trying to protect slavery. So when the abolitionists were doing mass mailings into the South in the 1830s, Calhoun is eventually going to write something called basically the defense of slavery. And he lists all the points as to why he thinks slavery is a good. He says slavery is not bad. Slavery is good. And then he listed reasons. And we don't need to go into all of them, but I want to point out a few. Part of the propaganda from his defense of slavery was that the life of a slave in the South was better and more dependable than the life of what Calhoun called a northern wage slave. In other words, these were the mass numbers of immigrants who'd come into New York City and other large urban areas in that decade, and they ended up working terrible jobs, living in terrible conditions in the the new factories that were emerging during that time period. So Calhoun's idea was... Slaves are better off and happier here than being working in all these horrible, destitute conditions up north. Now, that's what Frederick expected. He expected to go to the north and find the north full of all these John C. Calhoun stereotypes. Now, I also want to point this out. As Douglas is basically promoting capitalism, one of my favorite historians named Richard Hofstetter, in his book, The American Political Tradition, writes a chapter on John C. Calhoun, because John C. Calhoun was the leader of the secessionist movement from the earliest days. And um, what's fascinating about that, he titles the chapter, John C. Calhoun, The Marks of the Master Class. So in this moment right here, we have a huge clash between the ideas of capitalism and Marxism in Frederick Douglass's life. Well, and it's an interesting point because I talk about this a lot with kids all the time because it's a childish way of looking at the world. You think of the world as a pie because as children, you know, you have you see a cake and the concept is if you have a big piece, then that means I have to have a little piece because we think that everything in the world is like one giant cake. And so I want to be the person that gets the big piece. Well, what he realizes in the North is, wait a minute, everybody can have a big piece. There's no such thing as that. And so when he goes to the North, he goes, Everyone, there are people that are richer, but the richer people are making us rich. So everybody is growing. There's your win is not my loss. And it's a shift in thinking that it really slaps them in the face because in Baltimore, that's not what happened in the no. slave culture. If the slave was poor, it was if the white slave owner was rich, it was because the slave had to by necessity be poor. So they were operating in a zero sum game economy, which is a few people have everything and everybody else supports that. And that's not what he was looking at when he got up north. And it's he, he just can't even get over it. Well, to go back to Calhoun for just a moment, when Calhoun resigns as vice president of the United States, one of his statements is, I'm no longer speaking to you in, in the Senate as vice president of the United States. I am now only speaking to you as an oppressed citizen of South Carolina. So this whole idea... The world idea, could only hope. Well, what's interesting about this, this whole concept is that you have to understand, especially for our non-American listeners, 
that the South was ruled by a minority, and that minority was the handful of very wealthy people who controlled the plantations, who owned the vast, overwhelming majority of slaves. That group that controlled Southern politics is completely detached from the social classes below them. Right. A few people controlled everything, and they controlled the output, and they controlled the money and the resources, and that made everybody, by definition, dependent on them. And when he gets to the North, it's just sheer chaos. But he says there aren't naked kids running around. Right. Everybody seems to have food to eat. And although everyone seems to work, what he says this I find is interesting is they don't complain. Right. They're, the attitude that people had was quite different than those in the South that didn't feel like they were earning something of value with their time. They weren't, the harder I work, the more I get, wasn't a concept in the South, but it clearly was evidence in the labor and, of course, in the benefit, the financial benefit of the people in the North. So let me read this description about what he saw when these people and all these activities going on. He said, Um, Talking about the uh, Northerners, he said, I had very strangely supposed while in slavery that few of the comforts and scarcely any of the luxuries of life were enjoyed at the North compared with what were enjoyed by the slaveholders of the South. I suppose that they were about upon a level with the non-slaveholding population of the South. I knew they were exceedingly poor, talking about the Southerners who were not slaveholders, And I had been accustomed to regard their poverty as the necessary consequence of their being non-slaveholders. I had somehow imbibed the opinion that in the absence of slaves, there could be no wealth and there could be very little refinement, which is an interesting comment. And upon coming to the North, I expected to meet with a rough, hard-handed, and uncultivated population living in the most Spartan-like simplicity, knowing nothing of the ease, the luxury, the pomp, and the grandeur of Southern slaveholders. Such being my conjectures, anyone acquainted with the appearance of New Bedford may very readily infer how palpably I must have seen my mistake. And of course, this is kind of where he ends. He doesn't get into much after his life after that. Just to say it is at this point that begins, he's going to kind of bring in all the ideas here together at the end. He begins reading the newspaper. He begins discussing with the abolitionist. And at the very end, he takes up what he calls a cross and very reluctantly begins his profession as a speaker All right, so let's talk about the newspapers. Let's talk about this other comment here. I want to read this about Mr. Nathan Johnson and and tie it all together in this thought. Uh, Mr. Nathan Johnson lived in a neater house. He dined at a better table. He took, paid for, and read more newspapers, better understood the moral, religious, and political character of the nation than nine-tenths of the slaveholders in Talbot County, Maryland. Yet Mr. Johnson was a working man. What Frederick Douglass is hitting on right here, what the South did not have was a middle class. What the North did have was a middle class. And he's observing a middle class because he's lived his entire life in a part of the country where there were extremes of wealth and extremes of poverty and not much in the middle. Well, and the idea that your work is worth something. There's not an entitled gentry. There's not a group of people that feel like my essence is my contribution to society. Instead, there's a a mentality that my labor and my effort brings me value. And it's on this note that he finds value and, of course, devotes his life, let me say, starting a newspaper, and he brings together his capitalism and his literacy. He does, and therefore closes out the, the last chapter in a very, very, very interesting life. And yet begins another one because, of course, he goes on to do many other things, And one of those we're going to talk next week in our supplement, which we're not going to do a poetry supplement because I don't know that it's appropriate in this case. But Douglas, although fought obviously most, uh, most notably for abolition, he also was a champion of women's rights. And uh, in 1848, he went to Seneca Falls and he spoke eloquently in support of the Declaration of Sentiments. 
and he was one of the original signers of this manifesto drafted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And so next week, we're going to kind of shift gears and leave the abolitionists, and we're going to talk about Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and we're going to analyze the Declaration of Sentiments and talk about the ladies. (laughs) (laughs) And I'd like to remind everybody that when we started this series, we talked about reform movements. And there was a parallel in reform movement of getting rid of slavery and also promoting women's right to vote, all going on in the same town at the same time. That's where we'll pick up with. So thanks for being with us. We hope you enjoyed Frederick Douglass as much as we have and as we still do. He's foundational to the psyche of the United States in many, many ways. So thanks for being with us. Check us out on our Facebook page. We give you updates about when we post episodes. Follow us on Instagram at How to Love Lit Podcast. Also, go to our webpage, How to Love Lit Podcast.com. We've got a lot of fun things there. We have uh, listening guides and study guides and how to use podcasts in a classroom and all kinds of other great, wonderful reference tools for teachers. So, until next time, peace out.